This show is for the sales leader who knows they have a pivotal role in driving outstanding sales results. Getting hired or promoted to manage a sales team is a big accomplishment, but you know you have to work hard to become a great sales leader. You are listening to the Divine Comedy of Sales podcast. Here's your host, coach, and advisor to elite sales leaders from around the world, Matt McDarvey. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Divine Comedy of Sales podcast. I'm Matt McDarby, veteran seller, leader, coach and advisor to elite sales leaders all over the world. I'm really excited to have you join and listen to today's episode. This is one of our interview episodes, and I'd like to introduce you to my very special guest right now. I'm honored to have Dana Isola with me. Dana is... You know, I think I've said in other episodes, I'm choosing people to have conversations within the Divine Comedy of Sales podcast who I know, right? Not who I just know by reputation or I think they're pretty good, but who I've actually seen doing the job. And Dana is a great sales leader that I came to know while working with the sales leadership team at Medtronic, a division of Medtronic many years ago. And uh, I was struck by his capability in addition to being a, a good dude, uh, a guy that I connected with because he's a, a kind of a classic, typical Northeastern guy, uh, very direct, but super smart and great at the job of leading. I've asked him to join us today. I've also written about him. So there's a little bit of Dana's story that's in the Divine Comedy of Sales book. So you'll recognize him as uh, chapter one in the book. But uh, so happy to have Dana with me. Dana, Welcome. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be a part of this journey, Matt. And thank you for all the kind words. And I'm glad to have you with me. You're making me, you're making me blush. <laughs> yeah, right. So, so really, what I want to do is, is drill down into your experience as a sales leader. And the whole objective of interviewing here today, Dana, is to maybe grab a few nuggets from your experiences, from, you know, development opportunities and issues that you've addressed with members of your team and really just talk about some of the things you've learned. And what I'm going to try to try to do here is really get a deep understanding of kind of where you're coming from, how did you learn that, and help those who are listening figure out how they can apply some of the approaches that you've applied because uh, you're a great leader and uh, I think you've got a lot to say on this topic. So Appreciate let that. me just dive right in. Yeah. So let's just start sort of high level and and let's think about lessons you've learned. So, so what is the most important lesson you've learned so far about leading a, a sales team? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that if you're trying to build a high performing sales team with sustainable performance, there's nothing that's more important than starting with trust and transparency. That has to be the foundation uh, of, of the team and the fabric. And then, you know, you lay in bricks on top of that. So talk me through, so trust and transparency. Lots of ways to build trust and to lose trust. Tell me more about your approach. How do you, how do you build trust with the team? Yeah, so I mean, I, I think that if, if you are starting to, whether you inherited a new team, you're building a new team, whatever that is, there's not like a pre-existing uh, relationship there. You know, I, I kind of break it up into a couple different phases. You know, first is getting to know them, not coming in hot. You know, like, uh, you know, like, which is, a, I think, a, probably a common mistake to, to maybe new managers. You know, you're getting to know them as a person at home, who they are as people, you know, the current, the current self, making them better at their current job, maximize the comp plan, making sure that they become high performers. And then also the future self, who are they trying to evolve into and why? And then I would say two other important bullet points would be, uh, one, empowering them. You know, I, I think that, you know, someone who's going to own an initiative, own a strategy has a higher probability of executing it. You know, as a sales leader, it's our job to maybe turn the dial a bit, right? On, on what they're mm -hmm. doing, asking a lot of good questions on ultimately why they've chosen a particular path. And, you know, maybe if there's another path to consider, you know, you're, you're, you're tweaking it a little bit, but you're not owning it and then directing it. No one likes to be told what to do. And if you take you know, the entrepreneurship out of sales, you've taken the joy out of the job in my opinion. And then lastly is is standing by them if, if they're going through a hard time. I think that is a critical thing, especially with someone who is a highly valued and trusted member of the team. I'll come back to that. I want to hear more about standing by them and what you mean by that specifically. But um, so where would you say, would you say like day one, your first job as a sales leader, did you know 
like intuitively you have to plug in and understand the kind of the current state and, and then what people are trying to achieve? Or is this something that you'd say you learned over, over time? Like, how, how did you pick up on that? So my uh, first opportunity as a sales leader, I came in as, as actually someone who was one of their peers, you know, high, high performer. I was the guy, who, you know, you'd, you'd call if you try to, you know, trying to figure something out and help. I was, I was very active and in, in, uh, already active without a title, essentially, in their business. Mm-hmm. But when you go from friend, colleague, peer to someone that they're reporting to, obviously there's a, a bit of a transition. So one of the things that I was very self-aware about moving into that job is, you know, God made every single person unique to themselves. Everyone's got different skills, talents, abilities. They're going to get the job, do the job in a different manner. And it's, and I did not want to create a bunch of Dana clones. You know, it was, it was my job to understand, like I did my business a certain way that worked good for me and that necessarily isn't going to be best for you. I wanted people again, back to that empowerment thing that they are unique and we're going to be, I'm going to all work to have to become the best version of themselves individually and as a team. So I actually inherited a team. We, we have three open spots when I inherited it. Uh, the team wasn't performing uh, ultimately where we wanted to from a nationally stacked rank position. So actually one of the things when I came in outside, after I have, you know, filled those three headcounts who were, who were game changers, by the way, but either way on, on our first meeting, I wanted to kind of get a pulse as to ultimately, rather than saying to them, hey, this is where I expect us to be and where I want us to be. I mean, obviously I set the tone as far as, you know, this is what I believe we are capable of, but not down to a micro level. And also the the accountability that was going to be coming forward. But I, I wanted to give them an opportunity. I wanted to see what did they think that they were capable of. So I actually, at our, at our, at our first meeting, we, we got them, we were, uh, after I kind of had my, my opening, and we were talking a bit. I, I had a slide up that was kind of went on, you know, ultimately, what do you, what does this team want to be known for? What do you want to be considered known as nationally best at? This team is best at what? And then also we had a few KPIs, obviously percent to plan, what's the expectation and, you know, a, a number of other things, you know, fill in the blank. And I stepped out and I let them, uh, I let them make their goals, their plans, what they want to be known for themselves. Again, back to the, I didn't want to dictate anything to them outside of accountability and that we're going to win. Mm-hmm. And their their goals were actually higher than what I would have thought or anticipated myself. So it was great. So then at that point, step two, okay, well, how are we holding ourselves accountable? You know? So, you know, it, it really worked out really well. They even had like this fun thing that really helped with our team culture. Like they but at one point, but no, we were Boston. Uh, we, we was a New England team, and up there, Bonobos is this, this uh, pants, and they had like these very flashy pants, and it was like an American flag pants. And for whatever reason, they wanted the top performer for every month to, to take these pictures with these Bonobo pants. So like it became like this whole thing where they all wanted to be the highest performer each month, and they all were driving to be the best because they wanted to to be able to do this. And they were taking pictures like with their family, their kids all over uh, with people in hospitals and all unique places all around whatever city they're working out of. So it ended up being like a really cool culture driver too. That's a great story. And let's go back to where it started. Like you trusted the team enough for you were willing to demonstrate to them that you trusted them to give input, even into what we're trying to achieve and how we're achieving it. So for those of you listening, think about it. Like if you've ever been in a situation where you've been empowered, trusted, by your leader to define what we're trying to achieve and how we would go about achieving it. Didn't that feel different than when you were told or dictated to? I uh-huh. can think of plenty of scenarios of, of each type, right? Where I know I would definitely want to give more all that I possibly have to offer in those scenarios where that trust was extended first. So that's a great story. Um, I, I do, I want to come back to something that you asked. Maybe you can, maybe you can come around to it uh, by way of my next question. I know I can see it in the way you're answering the question and I've talked to you before. I know that you're passionate, you love being a leadership in a development role, comes uh-huh. out in your enthusiasm for the work and your excitement, even telling the story, you're like, this, you know, this is awesome. And it, that was a number of years ago, right? What is it that you love most about leading salespeople or leading a team? You know, providing opportunity, honestly, whether, and, and whether that is the process of hiring someone new or promoting somebody, the, the, the art of developing them into a future world. My 
belief set is that true leaders breathe leaders. And it's a core responsibility of the job. And, you know, I, I have this mindset uh, actually kind of uh, came a little bit from uh, one, of my, one of my mentors, Jeff Larson, who I love. The guy is incredible. But uh, it was kind of like, do the job before you have the job. Do the job before you ask for the job. And that's a core part of when you're looking into talent development, getting out of, you know, I talked in the first question about knowing their future self, who they're trying to become in the future, you know, whether they want to be a sales leader, marketing, sales training, international business, all of those opportunities have different skill sets, talents, and I would potentially delegate different responsibilities based on whatever their, that path was. And there's obviously a tremendous amount of accountability that comes along with that, right? So uh, I want to make sure that they're prepared for when they go in that interview and they nail it. You know, you've said it a couple of times, and I, I want to make sure people listening to this here, they can sort of in, gather or infer what your process is, that development looks like getting somebody from the current version of themselves to some future version. Now, mm-hmm. implied in that is that they know what that future vision looks like. And sometimes, I don't know, I've, I've had this experience where you ask people that question and they're not sure just yet. And it's a little bit of a journey to get there and get clear about what the future looks like. But if that includes leadership, right, uh-huh. you've got not only the task of helping them develop the skills to do their current job, if they're a salesperson, to build their skill and be as effective as they can, but to kind of try on and demonstrate and achieve some proficiency at the tasks of leading, which is kind of the, what you're talking about with, with Jeff and that, you know, demonstrate, you can do the, you can do the work, right? And I suspect knowing Jeff, I should try to get him on the, on the show at some point. I know he's grilling, chilling and grilling nowadays, but. Yeah. No, he'd be great. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. But he, um, he was su- such a great developer of people. I'm sure he could tell us stories about like, what are the challenges? Like, what did he lay out in front of you? What, you know, mm-hmm. and all the other people that he developed. Anyway, we'll come back to that. But the key is, I, I guess what I'm hearing is one of the things that you've enjoyed or come to love about this is like not only mapping out, it's not only the journey itself, but it's mapping out the journey and helping people understand how do they get from where they are today to where they want to be. I can totally relate to that. My best coaches did that for me too, right? I didn't even mm-hmm. know what the future path looked like until they invested time and helped me to see what, you know, what they thought. I could be uh, uh, what I could achieve in the future. Driving great sales results is hard. Doing it consistently is even harder. There are so many obstacles that can prevent you from becoming the most effective sales leader you can be. Find practical advice you can apply right away by picking up your copy of Matt's book, The Divine Comedy of Sales, at www.divinecomedyofsales.com. You said something about, uh, tell me, um, and I forget the words, it was something about having people's back or being there for people. What did you say? There was uh, something you said that struck me. Tell me more about what what you said and what you meant. Yeah, stand by them. So, you know, it it. it goes back to, you know, building trust, right? And, you know, team-wise, I mean, I just talked about player development, you know, as members of a team see you investing in other people on the team, getting responsibilities, doing more for the company, you know, maybe getting that next job or, you know, getting some type of recognition that inspires them to also kind of, what is that future version of myself? What do I want? How am I going to get it? And it, and it does, it, it does breed a culture of accountability within a team, uh, hope and trust because they feel like this person has our best interest at heart, right? Now w- with stand by them, which is also a trust, major trust builder, you know, I, I feel that when you, when you hire someone, I've always led on mindset and behaviors. If you believe that something's going to happen, you can manifest it to happen. The probability of it happening is higher. If you feel like something's not going to work out, don't even go. You've already defeated yourself, you know? Yeah. So it all starts with your mindset and then your behaviors. What are you doing during the day to lead success? I personally, obviously you have numbers, and you have analytics, and those are, are tools to try to diagnose where you are and where you want to go, where the business is heading, all critical things. But I believe when, especially when it comes down to uh, managing sales reps, I think it's all about mindset behaviors personally, because I feel like if you're doing the right things and you believe it's going to happen, eventually a number is going to turn. And as a sales leader, you hire someone that you believe in them, you need to stand by them. You need to believe in them. And then knowing that you believe in them is critical for retention. 
You don't want to hire someone who's got high potential, high talent. They have a bad year or a bad stretch and they think they're on the chopping block or they feel like they need to go find another job because you either don't believe in them, you're losing faith in them or whatever that is. So there was this one particular ref, one of my first hires, tremendous, who also was a future leader and started off hot, you know, just crushed it out of the gates first year, won some awards, did fantastic job. And, you know, it wasn't from, you know, just landing one big guy. It was, you know, doing business the right way and and conducting it the way you ultimately want a high performer to do it. And when you're looking at a future leader, like can this duck can this person teach the little things? They know the little things and can they teach it, right? He he mm-hmm. innately mm-hmm. have that. Very good communicator with that type of stuff. But you know, the second year Due to things out of his control, one of his bigger users at the hospital had, had the, the surgeon put it down based on a, uh, they'd a you know, new chief come in that had a, you know, different protocol. And unfortunately, he had, a, he had to dig himself out of a hole. And he was freaking out um, because he's been a high performer his whole life. And, you know, now all of a sudden he's in the red, you know, for, for you know, half a year. And, you know, we had conversations on it. We, I always used to do quarterly business reviews with my reps in this particular role. And, uh, and he, in, you know, he exposed like his insecurity. And, and you talk about transparency, you want to have yeah. that door. You don't want him looking for a job. You want him coming to you saying, I feel insecure. I feel uncomfortable. I feel whatever that is, right? And right. you build from there. So, you know, instead of, I, I wanted to, A, you know, change his mindset from this, you know, thought where he was beating himself up on a daily basis to, well, I'm like, first off, you know, you want to be a future leader, right? So this, you understand you are impacting this team on a grander scale than just your number. So step one, like if you want to dig yourself out of the hole, do what you always do. Focus on your mindset, focus on your behaviors. This is, you know, and then we went over, we created a strategy on how we could just do the right things every day and turn around this number. Turn around the number, pressure goes down, make more money, feel better by yourself. Step two, in the time that it's going to take to rebuild your number, like you're also impacting others on the team. If you want to be a leader, you need to think holistically. You need to think bigger, broader, right? So if you're uh-huh. impacting other people on the team and that's impacting improving their performance, you're impacting the team's performance as a future leader. And uh-huh. third point and most critical is if you want to be a future leader, be thankful, be grateful for your challenge because you learn most through the storm and you grow most through the storm. And now you're, you're, you are going to turn it around because that's who you are. And, and then you're going to have a story to help somebody else in the future that are going to be in the same exact position. You're going to hire this person. They're going to go through a challenge. They're going to freak out and you're going to tell them stick through it because you've been in their seat and you're going to be more relatable in that moment because you have sat in their seat. So be thankful that you have this and just work your way out of it. Great story because it illustrates a few things. They all go to trust. One of them is the stand by them. What's, you know, sort of jumps out at me from that example is you're showing and other, like other orientation, right? It's about them yeah. and you're focused on them. It's not about, right? Not about you in that moment. But you also said you learn most during the storm, I think was how you put it. Yeah. And having learned from a lot of failures myself over time as a salesperson, as a manager, I'm like, yeah, those are the, those are the lessons that stick the most so that that person in the example you're talking about, when they become a leader, That goes to their credibility in the role, right? They understand, like they get it. Like, I know I've been through this exact situation. I fell on my face. Let me help you try to avoid it, right? So yeah, awesome. A great way of describing it. And I love, so stand by them. You're listening, right? Stand by them, write it down. (laughs) Try it. And and you learn more during the story. He he was, he hit his number for the rest of the year and then was promoted a little after a year after that, after one more, one more year. So, you know good end to the story. Yeah, totally. There's one more part of this that I think anyone listening can infer, but we'll make it more explicit that this was somebody who you believed in. You thought this person had the potential. You said that earlier. This person Mm -hmm. had the potential to develop and meet expectations and grow. Now, if this was someone who did not, who you believe did not have the potential to grow, I imagine you probably wouldn't have invested in the same way. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, that's kind of goes to the, um, uh, your assessment that this person had the potential and But and not really only are you building grow. trust and transparency and trust in that moment, other people see that they feel that they notice that. So you're, 
is a ripple effect, a very positive ripple effect of the team culture and the relationships you have with everybody because they know that you'll believe in them and you'll stand by them. That's critical. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. There's um, in any moment, you're either with your team, you're either building trust or eroding it. There's no neutral, right? right? It's sort of yeah. one or the other. All right. So I'm going to ask you one last question and uh, I'm going to go to one of my later questions. Who's had the most influence on you in your work as a leader? So I believe life is a journey and, and we all have, you know, obviously you continue to evolve as we all are, you know, so I, I would love to say one person, but I got to say a few just because I've continued sure. to evolve in my life. I'd say number one, definitely my father, you know, first person in our, in our family to really hit a big and, or, or, you know, have significant success, wealth, whatever in his career came from nothing, just total grinder, CEO by 40 years old, started a company. I mean, he's, he, he's done wonderful things, taken, you know, companies, uh, public and, um, but it, <laughs> To say that that there was extreme accountability and a lot of you know I want to call it pressure, but you know you, we, we, there was a lot of structure going up, right? And sure. you know I've definitely learned the art of dedication, commitment, you know, hard work, and you know really the, creating the structure on a daily basis to be successful and holding yourself to a super high expectation because. We had high expectations and they were to be met. Uh, second, like, you know, as I was evolving from, you know, almost like a, a sniper to a commander, you know, when I was transitioning from sales into sales leadership, I had a big gap on certain things. And, and my manager at the time, Gary Stark, we, did a great job oh. at teaching me uh, and, and having me think on behalf of the company and ultimately what the company needs, how you serve the company better just kind of like the overall just corporate image and how you conduct yourself on a daily basis as a leader. He, he was, you know, he, he really invested a lot of time helping me improve that and prepare me for my job. And then once I got my job, obviously, you know, I, I, I had mentioned Jeff Larson earlier, uh -huh. couldn't, the ultimate mentor, I mean, God, I was so fortunate to have him as someone that developed me on a daily basis. The ultimate blocking and tackling. I mean, had just, you know, came from the old U.S. surgical world. They, they built up that business and that whole market development landscape, had so much leadership um, e experience. He would see things that were going to happen before they happened. He There was not a scenario or situation that he hadn't seen a million times over. And, you know, just tremendous. He, he always knew he, 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 like he said, he had your back, you know, and I couldn't say enough, enough positive things. I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for Jeff. I could tell you that much. And then lastly, my current leader, Jeremy Lehner, who I've known for, you know, I, we worked actually back in the day at Sailing. We were reunited where I am now at Providence Medical. And I mean, this guy is just like, uh, he's Jordan. You know, I mean, he just, he, he does everything well. You know, Greg, first off, incredible human. So, you know, when you talk about trust and like wanting to work hard for somebody, I mean- he, he, he's, he's just, you want to give it all for him, you know, doing the job, not asking people to do anything that you're not willing to do on a daily basis. He's sacrificing as much or more than anybody on our team. He is just constantly in grind and he's polished. Like he has this CEO presence, but then like this off the charts, like ability and just is able to kind of really bring in anybody that you want to be, just a guy you want to work for. And, and just, um, I've learned a lot about, uh, especially from the senior presence, from him, from working with him uh, here. So, you know, to have the, the mentor, and I have so many other people I could, I could mention, but I mean, yeah. to have the love, the, the mentorship that I've had in my career, I mean, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. So it's, it's part of the reason why I love, you know, giving opportunity and promoting other people. Cause like, I, I want to give back. I want to be yeah. all the people have done for me. I'd love to you know, do the same for others. Yeah. I mean, listen, Michael Jordan had a free throw coach, a three-pointer coach, a mid-range uh -huh. coach, a dribbling coach. I, I mean, and you're talking about the best player to ever live. So right. that it says a lot. Yeah, for sure. Hey, Dana, I'm going to, when we wrap up here, I'm going to pull a couple of the kind of the key principles and gems you've shared with the audience today. Before I do that, I want to say thank you so much. I know how busy you are and how valuable your time is, but Thanks for taking the time to offer some stories and for frankly being a great example of what excellent sales leadership looks like and be able to being able to describe it to people so they can maybe replicate some of this. 
So thank you. I appreciate it, Matt. Wow, it was so great to have Dana Isola on the show. I want to quickly summarize a few things that we heard from Dana and then a sort of a call to action here for you as a listener to this episode. What can you take from this conversation with Dana and apply to your own environment starting like tomorrow or even today? So he said a few things that I think are really critically important. And uh, maybe there are other, uh, other things from the conversation that, that uh, resonated with you, but in no particular order, one of the things that he said that he's learned that's critically important to be an effective leader is you really have to understand uh, for each member of your team, not only the current state or the current self, but the future self, right? Helping to understand where people are today and where they want to go. What is that future vision of success for them is a critical thing. And something that Dana invests heavily into understanding. Um, he said in his role, his job is to provide opportunities. He also said, true leaders breed leaders. Totally, totally agree with that. So my question for you is, as you look at the people that you lead, do you have a bench of people who are clearly the next person up? And are there leaders that you're breeding and developing in your organization? If you're not, I'm not going to put that all on you, but it's a challenge. What can you do to breed more leaders, to develop more leaders in your organization? Because that is the mark of a great leader. Dana also mentioned, it was a, we were talking about sort of learning, and he said, we learn most during the storm when things are hard. So true, right? I know that from my own experience. So think about in your environment, if there's adversity, if there are challenges, what are the lessons that your people can learn or people on your team can learn during adversity? Right? I know there are a lot of markets. It's the spring of 2023 when we're recording this episode. Regardless of when you're listening to it, somewhere down the line, there's still adversity. There's always going to be issues in the marketplace or issues with a customer or issues within the lives of members of your team. What are the lessons that you can help them to learn because it's in those times of adversity when those lessons really stick. So, gosh, Dana was awesome. He's a, such an effective leader, a, a friend, and I'm so glad to have been able to write about him and now have him join the show. So think about, based on today's episode, what is it that you've learned that you can apply to your role, either as a leader today or as you think about that role as a leader that you want to grab for yourself tomorrow. Maybe it's a role that you're aspiring to. What can you learn from Dana's lesson? I think plenty. So thank you so much for joining and listening to today's episode. This is Matt McDarby, host and author of The Divine Comedy of Sales. Thank you so much for joining us. I will look forward to having you with us next time. In the meantime, take good care of yourself. We'll see you soon.